Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inside the Draft with Greg Cosell. It's Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan, and then some other. Oh, yeah, that's Greg Cosell. What's going on? The star of the show. We are uh, happy to have Greg back. This is now part four, Greg, of a six part series previewing the draft. Well, really, the first five preview the draft, and then the last one, you're going to recap the picks with us. This might be arguably one of the most important installments that we do with you because we're going to focus on linebackers in this uh, draft. And, uh, and of, of course, from an Eagle standpoint, Greg, and um, we're going to ask you a little bit about how you grade linebacker tape, like we've been doing with the other prospects, right. had some changes. And then of course, we'll, we'll get into some prospects yeah. and, uh, and talk about how they f- might fit within the Eagles scheme. I say it's important because, you know, we know the Eagles don't draft linebackers in the first round. Um, but that doesn't mean that second, third, and, and then day three guys are not important. They've been very important to the history of the franchise, whether it's a Trotter or a Jordan Hicks or a Michael Kendricks. Uh, clearly, there have been times where they've used those those day two and day three guys that, to play critical roles on this team, on their team. Well, you know, it's funny. Like any position, and then I don't know if we just have discussed this before, but everybody now talks about the word value. That's, that's the new thing that you see all over social media when it comes to the draft. And, you know, I've always believed that value is in the eye of the beholder. I've talked to so many defensive coaches through the years. And when you don't have someone good at a given position, they will tell you it limits what you can do. So, At the end of the day, you can sit and talk about value, what's a value position, what's not a value position. But if you don't have good players at a particular position, particularly on the defensive side of the ball, then there are limitations schematically and tactically. Mm. And I don't think anyone would argue that Levante David and Devin White were two critical players in the Super Bowl run by the Bucs this past season. So, again... That's always debatable. Reasonable people can disagree. But I know for a fact that when you don't have one or two, that causes problems in your defense. Greg, how important is it from a coverage standpoint? Jeff talked about first Eagles probably are not going to draft a first round linebacker. And most teams don't believe that you need to unless they're special. But with the league switching to such matchups, we know about the tight ends and being so athletic and running backs out of the backfield. When when you grade tape, do you see such – and you, it was kind of like you're saying. Do you see such a lack of, of those type of players now? Is it become such a mat, matchup league that sometimes you have to take a guy a little bit earlier? Well, let me answer that this way, and, it, and this leads into the evaluation of college players. What is the NFL game now predominantly? The NFL game defensively predominantly, and percentages are different with each team – It's extremely high for a team like the Bills, for instance, who played in their nickel 90% of the snaps last year. But most teams play in some form of sub package, predominantly nickel, over 65% of their snaps. So when you're looking at linebackers coming into the NFL, you have to think in terms of can they play in your 4-2 nickel? It's not 20 years ago where the first thing you thought of was their ability to take on blocks in the box, to stack and to shed. Now, would you like to have that trait? Of course you would. But that is no longer the number one trait you look for when you look at linebackers coming from the college game to the pro game. At the end of the day, they've got to be able to play with range. They've got to be able to play in space. They've got to be able to bend. They've got to be able to flow. They've got to be able to match up man-to-man versus backs and or tight ends. They have to be able to play in your sub packages. If they can't do that, they're not going to get a lot of snaps. So you talk about the changing nature of of linebackers coming into the league and the way you evaluate linebackers. I think that's the most critical part, Adam, is that you have to think in terms of can they play in your 4-2 nickel? Let's also talk about resource allocation a little bit, because I think you have to have that conversation when you're and talking that's value. about the, the Eagles, right? Value. <laughs> the Eagles are, are a 4-3 team. And Greg, I'm sure you talk. Uh, the Eagles are not the, uh, despite what fans might say about them, they are not the only team that runs a 4-3 that invests heavily in the defensive line right. and in cornerback. And then when you switch offensive side, they invest heavily in their offensive line as well as quarterback when they have one. You can only invest so much in so many positions. Correct. So 
to make it clear, I don't think that people uh, with the Eagles think that linebacker is not an important position. But when you start to draft the hierarchy of positions that you value as important and want to put money into, it happens to be that linebacker is not going to be in their top three or four of those spots. And that's why we are where we are. But I mean, I imagine, Adam, you talk to teams that also have that same philosophy. It's not just an Eagles philosophy. Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a linebacker situation where t- other than what Greg's saying, teams just don't believe unless you're a superstar, like an Isaiah Simmons, you're a multi-positional player. Like a Parsons, so Parsons got some, we'll get into him. He's got significant off the field concerns, but he's a gifted player. Unless you're super special, you're a linebacker, you're not going in the first round. A, a Keekly, okay, for instance. But right. get, getting back to what uh, you were talking about, Jeff, and, and, and what Greg's talking about, I, I do wonder, though, Greg, when you, when you grade and watch college tape, as you have uh, yes. several decades, how is it being taught? Because you and I have talked about over the years about how the quarterback position has been taught. Do you see – and then you talk about nickel and sub and, 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 and dime and so forth, big nickel. But do you see it taught differently or the guys are, are, are playing differently at the college level than they are at, at this level? I can't speak because I'm not a coach to how it's being taught. So I'm not going to go there because okay. one thing I try to pride myself on is not to talk about something I don't know. Sure. So I don't know how it's taught, but you have to think of it this way. The college game over the last number of years has become truly a spread game. Now the hash marks help that because the hash marks are wider in college football, but clearly over the years with the proliferation of seven on seven kids at an early age are playing seven on seven that pretty much translates to college football now. Mm. So the game is more spread out. So now what do you need? You need linebackers who are more athletic and can play with range as opposed to being box players who play in confined space. So at the end of the day, the linebackers who come into the NFL are rangier, more athletic players who for the most part, there's always exceptions, who for the most part are lighter. So people always say when they evaluate linebackers, oh, he's 229, he's too light. Well, those are the kinds of players that college football is sending to the NFL because they have to be able to defend a lot of field and to defend the passing game. Jamin Davis, right? The kid from Kentucky would be a guy you're talking about. Well, yeah, but he's he's 6'3 plus and 234. Right. He's a a little different. And we'll discuss him. He's long and can run. Yeah, we'll discuss him because he was one of my absolute favorite linebackers. Yeah, he – he, he's a guy, but no, I just wanted to, I was hoping you would touch on that because when I first started in the cover league, if you weren't six, two and two fifty, right. You were dropping. Now right. it's, it's, as you were talking, you could be six, one and two twenty five, and you could go in the second round. Correct. Which, right. They, because, those type of guys would have won in the sixth round. twenty. Right. Cause the bottom line is that the guys who are six, two, two fifty, Unless they're special athletes. Look, Micah Parsons is a special athlete. There's always exceptions. But in general, and and he's more than a box player because he's such a a superior athlete. But normally, guys, I think of a guy who came out of Clemson a few years ago. I don't know if you'll remember him. His name was Trey Lamar. He was a big, big big-time recruit to Clemson. Um, I think he was a two- or three-year starter. He was about 6'2", 6'2 250. He was a box player. I don't remember if he even got drafted, but he didn't make it in the league because that kind of player doesn't play in the NFL now. Um, yes, do you play your base defense? Of course you do. But it, but when all said and done, those players, if you talk about resource allocation slash value, those players who can't play against the pass and in your sub don't really have a ton of value at the linebacker position nowadays. Absolutely. I, listen, I've asked you this for every position group that we've uh, examined so far since episode one. So I'll ask you the same thing. Can you go through some of the position specific traits that you look for when you're evaluating linebackers? It's playing off what we've spoken about, Jeff. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to play with range. You need to be able to change direction. You need to be able to, to play sideline to sideline. You must, and you don't see this as much as you would like when you watch tape, but you must be able to cover man-to-man. And you also, obviously, when you play zone, you must play underneath coverage and have a feel and awareness for route concepts. Because we're way past the point in the NFL where 
linebackers underneath defenders just drop to a landmark and stand there because you need to be aware of route concepts because all zones end up being match up at some point. You know, 20, God, it's, it's, we're going into the 2021 season, 20, 20 plus years ago, when let's say Tony Dungy and cover two became really big in the league and a lot of people played it, mm -hmm. those underneath defenders were landmark defenders. By that, I mean, they would drop to a spot. But that became too easy to beat over time. Right. So you no longer are, are just dropping to a spot and standing there. It's like in, in basketball. If you play zone, you don't just stand in a spot. You know, it, it that that's too easy to beat. So if you're playing... Is that under, what my problem was? Right, right, right. <laughs> so if you're a linebacker uh -huh. and an underneath zone defender, you have to have an awareness of formations, splits, route concepts, where receivers are coming from. Mm -hmm. If they're on your side or are they crossing to come to your side, you have to be aware of all these things. Sure. And the added element to that now with quarterbacks that can move is you also have to be aware that the quarterback can run if it's third and nine and you're doing that. So these are the kinds of things you look for when you watch linebackers now. So it sounds like just to summarize uh, speed slash quickness or athleticism, change of direction, spatial awareness. Those are range, probably yes. yeah, the, the, the major yeah. criteria. Yes. Now I know and, that and we're man, talking and man to man coverage ability and man to man coverage. And, and how much though is tackling still because well, I know that sounds yeah. obvious, Greg, but yeah, there know, are a lot of there yeah. are a lot of linebackers. And I'm sure when you're doing evaluation where you say this guy can run with anybody, but he doesn't have the nose for the football in, yeah. in a pile there. It's funny you say that because a lot of these smaller players and I've had this conversations with a couple of GMs um, over the last uh, month or so where they talk about guys who are really, you know, explosive type athletes. But because they're 225, they're they're drag down tacklers and therefore they give up yards after contact. We think of yards after contact for running backs and receivers, yeah. but for defensive players, you get that too. In other words, you're in good position. You grab the guy, but you can't get him down right there. So you give up yards after contact. And that happens if you're 225 as opposed maybe to 240. So that's something you also have to look at because every yard in a game matters. Let's, uh, Greg, let's get into a couple of, uh, of Eagle players here. One of them will be Eric Wilson. Yeah. Comes over from Minnesota. Give us your thoughts on him from um, the tape and how he'd fit in here in Philly. Well, first of all, they're going to play the Minnesota defense. So he's going to know what, what the defense is. Yep. I liked Eric Wilson on tape. I think that he's a player that can play off the ball and he can play on the ball. Uh, and he got a lot of snaps this year. He became a starter because Anthony Barr got injured. But he's uh, over the years has played a lot of snaps for the Vikings. Yeah, and it's funny. You spoke about the fact that the Eagles have seemingly not prior, prioritized linebacker. And now there's a defense with, with a, uh, the new defensive coordinator, Gannon. Look at what, And he wasn't with Minnesota, but it's going to be that defense. But look at the players Minnesota had. They had Kendricks. Was he a first or a second round pick? Second a, a rounder. Speedy? Anthony Barr was a first. And Barr was a first and a pretty high first. Yes. Within the top 20, I believe. Yes. So, I mean, there's a team, they're going to play that defense, and they had two really, really good linebackers. Um, and then Wilson came in and played, obviously. And But I think Wilson's a really solid player. Um, they also used him at times in their pressure schemes. Um, so he's he's was asked to do a lot in Minnesota and did it well. I, I think he's a, just a good football player. I mean, you could, I don't think you're going out on a limb right now to say that he's the best linebacker on the Eagles roster right now. Well, do you like uh, – I mean, you, you got a lot to see of Alex Singleton last year. First, why don't you tell me, knowing the, the Minnesota defense, <clears throat> right. what role Singleton will play and what role Wilson will play? Well, Singleton was the strong side linebacker. So he played on the ball and he played off the ball. And I thought he played very well. I guess the at the end, at the end of the day, you want to play your best player. So Singleton, barring anything unforeseen, and Wilson are both going to play at the same time. So the question is, who's who? Wilson, I, they could well see Wilson. And I don't know this. I'm just kind of spitballing here. They could well see Wilson as the Mike, the, the Kendricks role. I would not surprise me if they see him that way. Maybe, Adam, you know more about that than I do, but I could see him in that role and then Singleton in the the, the, the Sam linebacker role. Yeah, and, and plus, you know, we know they're going to be a nickel team, so um, these these would be the two guys that would be on the field. And as you were saying earlier, we can't emphasize this much enough. 
Um, teams are not playing very much base. So, no. if, and he's not, I know he's sort of a lighter player, but if they don't think he needs to be in a base whenever they play that sure yardage typically, then they take him out and we'll see who else they have. But also Davion Taylor, Greg, I know he barely played. Well, what do you recall from him yeah. um, in your college <laughs> game? See, I think he was drafted to be a, a sub player. I mean, he's an athlete. I mean, that's the thing. I remember watching his tape. He's light. He's a classic case of what we're speaking about. Mm. I don't have his numbers right in front of me, but I think he was in the 225 range, wasn't he? I mean, he was not over 230 pounds. Right. And he's an athlete. He can run. Now, again, he's going to have to learn a new defense this year, but so are a lot of guys. So everybody's in the same boat, um, except for Wilson and Anthony Harris, of course. Um, so I think that he gets a clean slate. And, you know, he's clearly, to me, a sub-package player, uh, ideally, because of his athletic traits. He's, he's got some explosiveness to him, some suddenness to him. The key thing, and I don't have a great feel for this, because I don't remember seeing a ton of it in college, is whether he can match up man-to-man. Mm. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but that, that'll be important. Now, if he truly sticks, Gannon, that is, to the Minnesota profile, There'll be a lot of cover four, but it's not all cover four. No one does the same thing yep. all the time. You have to play man to man in this league at some point, but there'll be a lot of cover four. Now, cover four ends up being a matchup concept. It's zone based, but match, but it has matchup principles. So Taylor is is the most interesting guy because he was a third round pick and he does have the kinds of traits that lend themselves to playing in sub. I'm sorry. There you go. Let's get into some of the prospects the, okay. that are going to be available. Now, obviously, Micah Parsons, we mentioned, he seems to be, uh, well, I'll let you say it. You tell me the, the player that he is that you see, Greg, and this, the best kind of scheme for him. Well, it's interesting with Parsons because when he came out of high school, uh, there were a lot of colleges that were recruiting him as a defensive end. That's what he played in, in high school. He was a defensive end. Mm -hmm. So he became a linebacker. He's over 6'3". He's 246. He's one of those guys that's freakish um, because at 246, he's highly athletic. Uh, Now, he's got great movement traits. He's sudden. He's explosive, both downhill and laterally. He can line up in different positions. You could see him as a guy in your sub that is a pass rusher because that's essentially what he was coming into college. He's got short area quickness. He's got sideline to sideline speed and range. Uh, He's a really, what we like to call reactive athleticism. He's got great reactive athleticism. Um, There's not much athletically that he can't do. So it's just a question of how you see him within the context of your defense. Now, I don't know what the Eagles have in mind. Maybe it's a whole new world, but he could fit the Anthony Barr role very, very well, because Anthony Barr was obviously uh, the linebacker in Minnesota who played linebacker in base, but was often, not all the time, but was often used as a pass rusher in sub. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that Parsons could be that guy. Is he, now, now at the next level, depending obviously where he, who drafts him, you see him as a multi-positional player. You, you, it sounds like you, you, you would say that, right? Because he could play strong side linebacker. He could play DN. Do you see him being able to line up in multiple positions? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's bigger and more explosive. But, and again, people know I watch the entire league. But I, I think of him the way that the Titans use Rashawn Evans. Rashawn Evans is a linebacker in their base and somewhat in their nickel. But then when they go to dime, he's essentially a pass rusher. Hmm. And, and Parsons is a bigger man and a more explosive athlete, but we're just talking about deployment now, not the player. So I want people to understand that. I'm talking about deployment and utilization. Parsons could be that kind of player. I mean, you're dealing with a, a guy with high level athletic traits. So you want to make sure you get the absolute most out of those athletic traits. I mean, he's got great balance, great body control. He's an explosive athlete. He can rush the quarterback. He can play in space. Um, I don't think I saw him cover very much at Penn State in terms of of man-to-man, but again, that just was the defense in which he played. He's athletically, you would believe he's more than capable of that. Is is there a a fair comparison? I've heard Isaiah Simmons from Clemson last year, kind of similar in in athleticism and what you can do with him. Have you seen that? Oh, 
that's, I think Parsons is a little different athlete. I didn't see Simmons to me, mm -hmm. he was big and I stood next to him at the combine and he's big. Okay. Simmons is six, four plus and two thirty eight, And man, does he look the part, but the way in which he plays, he's a safety. Mm. Parsons is not a safety part and Parsons does not play like a safety. Uh, so you know, I think that Simmons is just a big, big man who's who's got a freakish build and is a really good athlete, but he's a safety. Mm -hmm. That's not Parsons. Parsons is a different is he's a different cat. All right. Uh, how about Jeremiah Owosu Koromoa? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and Zayvon was Collins. a bullfrog. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he was a bullfrog and, a uh, and apparently a yeah. linebacker for Notre Dame. <laughs> um, uh, and also and Zayvon Collins, if those two, uh, you know, you can break them down for us. Yeah. Owusu Koromo is a fascinating guy because um, I heard from someone that he basically played at 210, 212 this year at Notre mm -hmm. Dame, um, but he was at 221 in his pro day, which tells you he wants right. to be a linebacker yeah. because yeah. It, when you watch him, you think, hey, this guy's a safety, really, mm -hmm. but he wants to be a linebacker. Um, now, his game, the foundation of his game is athleticism, speed, explosiveness, and this guy triggers. He has got as quick a trigger when he sees it as any linebacker in the draft and that I've seen in recent years. I mean, this guy goes, and when he goes, he goes. And he's just super explosive. So now the question is, what is he? Um, he's not a stack backer. He's not a box player. He's not a confined space player. You want this guy to have room. Now he lined up as an overhang player, which means he's just outside the box. He lined up as a slot player. He matched mm -hmm. up to wide receivers. He matched up to tight ends. Uh, so you have to decide in the context of your defense what he is. But there, there are very few guys in this draft with his explosive movement traits. You know, we use the term, you know, scouts use it all the time, twitchy. Next to the word twitchy is this kid. This kid <laughs> just goes. Um, and he can match up to wide receivers. He can run with them. He can run with tight ends. Uh, you know, people say guys are around the ball and find the ball. You know, that's a cliche, but there's truth to it. He's this guy. I mean, he finds the football. He's explosive when he had a chance to generate speed and velocity. When he didn't have a chance to generate speed and velocity, he was the kind of guy that gave up yards after contact because he's not big. But if he could generate speed and velocity, he got you to the ground. Greg, and then your favorite guy and a guy every scout that I've talked to or anyone in scouting has watched Jamie Davis from Kentucky. Well, we, I, I guess Jeff wanted me to talk about Zayvon Collins first. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. We'll yeah, go to Collins. Let me get we'll to go to, I want to go to Davis because there's some then really we'll, interesting stuff. Yeah. We'll go to Davis after Collins. Got it. Collins is a totally different guy. He's 6'5", 259. Um, and he plays like an athlete, not like a physical guy. It's strange to say, but a guy who's basically 260, he's more of an athletic space run and chase finesse linebacker than a physical power player, despite the size. Hmm. Um, he's got excellent athleticism. When you see him run, he runs like a much smaller man. He's got range. He's got speed. Um, he, he made some interceptions this year where when he was returning, he looked like a big running back. <laughs> I, I think he, in one game, he ended the game. I forget who it was against with a 96 yard interception return for a touchdown. Mm -hmm. And when he was running, he looked like just a big running back. I'm not going to sit here and say he looked like Derrick Henry, but he just looked yeah. like a big running back. Um, he did not play with a lot of physicality. That's the thing that needs to be developed. Can he play that way? But he's, he's a very multi-dimensional and multi-positional guy. That's the way he was used at Tulsa. He kind of reminded me of, and, and this guy's back with New England. He kind of reminded me of the way Bill Belichick uses Kyle Van Noy, but Collins is just a much, much bigger man than Kyle Van Noy. Um, if you remember Fred w Warner coming out of BYU, not the way he's played with the Niners, but at, and he's one of the three or four best linebackers in the league now, Fred Warner. But at BYU, he played a ton over the slot. He played a ton as an overhang player. Um, in fact, people didn't know if he could play stack, which we know he can because he's done it now with the Niners. But he kind of reminded me of that, of Warner's tape coming out of BYU. But Collins is just a big man who is a really, really good athlete. My sense watching his tape was that he had really good football intelligence. He recognized things. He was aware. Um, there was a playmaking dimension to his game. 
He made impact plays every game. Hmm. So Jamie Davis is a guy that a lot of people like in scouting. In fact, some guys I know have gone back twice because they see some stuff and they see a lot of things that you can do with them. So Greg, give us an idea of what you saw on tape from him. Um, I watched him like seven weeks ago. Okay. Before the Jamin Davis, you know, bandwagon started. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. You know, cause I, you know me, I don't get into that kind of thing. I just watch guys and yeah. I see what the tape shows. Um, I knew nothing about this guy when I watched him. zero. And I put the tape on with this guy and I ended up watching way too much of him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this guy is, you know, let's put Micah Parsons aside because he's a little freakish in his athletic movements. But I, I think Jamin Davis is right up there as a good a linebacker prospect as there is in this draft. Mm. He's six, three and a half, 234. For whatever it's worth, he ran a 448. Think about that. And his vertical jump was 42, which mm. is really impressive. Um, I think he has size, length, play speed, range, coverage ability. I think he's a three down linebacker. Now I can't speak to the team he goes to, what he'll be asked to do, the learning curve. I can't speak to that. I don't know Jamin Davis, yeah. but he's got three down linebacker traits right off the bat. Mm. I even said in my notes that, Hey, that might not happen week one, but it will happen. I mean, he's long, he's fluid, he's rangy. He's got some explosiveness to him. I mean, he had an 85 yard interception return for a, touchdown this year in which he made an unbelievable catch with body flexibility athleticism hands um and then there was a game this year against georgia where he ran down james cook who's a dalvin cook's little brother and who has great speed and i mean this kid to me has great traits we you asked me about evaluating linebackers when we started this kid can close down space he can play with range and while he didn't often match up to tight ends there's no question in my mind that his length and athletic traits strongly suggest he can do that. I haven't heard you speak this glowingly about a prospect since last week in Jason Owa. So this is, uh, this <laughs> is Jamie another Davis guy. Has, yeah. Jamie Davis has production. Owa didn't have the production. Right. Davis has production. Now, you could argue he's a one-year starter, and, and that mattered. Adam knows. There, there are a lot of scouts and organizations that look at that and 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 might drop him down a peg. I mean, they're not going to drop him to the fifth round because mm -hmm. the traits are too good, but they might just say, hey, we're not sure. We're not going to take him 18th. We're going to hope that he's there at 35. I, I mean, say he's not getting out of the second round is what I'd heard. So, yeah, this kid is – this yeah. kid's got traits. He's, yeah. Yeah. he's six three and a half. I mean, you know, 6'3 and a half, 234. The, the testing traits are there, and the, the tape backs it up. Awesome. I want to ask you about another linebacker because um, on our other show uh, with Quentin, Michael and Jason Avant Q and a on inside the birds, they were, uh, they were, they were going through Nick Bolton who from, I think Missouri, is it correct? The linebacker Missouri. from Missouri. Yeah. And um, they know that he ran, I guess he didn't run very well at his pro day, something like a four, six or a four, seven, but they both were talking about his tape in their mind uh, being pretty good. They liked what they saw. So I, I throw it to you, Greg, Nick Bolton from Missouri. Nick Bolton will be the litmus test for everything we're talking about. He's mm -hmm. under six feet. He's 237. Is he going to be a sub package player? Now you put on this kid's tape. He's a classic run and hit stacked linebacker, high level competitiveness and energy, strong play recognition and reaction and a quick explosive trigger. This kid sees it and he freaking goes. Um, but then you have to stop and think, is he going to match up to tight ends is he going to match up to backs? Um, he did a little of that at Mizzou, but he's kind of got a sawed off build. So at 5'11", and again, this is the question you got to ask yourself. At 5'11", is this kid matching up? And, and I'm only throwing out these names because these are the people you got to match up to. Is he going to match up to Travis Kelsey? Is he going to match up to George Kittle? Um, and is he going to match up to Darren Waller? Uh, you, you know, is he going to match up to Dallas Goddard? You know, he's 5'11". Um, I think different teams will have different answers to that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, my sense is no. You know, if, if I was in the draft room or I was in the draft meetings, I'd have major question marks about whether he can do that. Yeah, arm length is going to be really big for shorter guys, sawed off guys. They're going to have to they're going to have to make it up some way. I'll, I'll be interested to see what happens there because he's look, we all know he's a good football player. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, how that goes down. Um, I want to ask you about a guy that a lot of people, a lot of people in Scotland talk about because of the school he goes to. But what did the tape show you about Dylan Moses? Dylan Moses is an interesting guy because Dylan Moses to me is is a classic case of a guy with traits who the tape does not back up the traits mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Others could see it differently, and I'm cool with that. Um, but I think he's a high level athlete, physical skill set and traits to play any linebacker position. And he showed flashes of explosive movement in all aspects of the position. Now, 2020, he was a year removed from a season engine, season ending injury in 2019. So there could well be a sense he's an ascending player with the best yet to come. But I would say, while his 2020 tape showed, that athleticism, those movement traits, those physical traits, they didn't show up enough for me. Um, I thought that his play recognition was not there. Um, I just, I felt like he was a high level traits prospect who showed outstanding flashes, but has concerns. Now, how that, how teams see that, because this kid from the moment he got to Alabama, I mean, he was a big, big time recruit. He was a five star recruit. He was viewed as one of the top, if not the top linebacker prospect in the nation. Um, but to me, it just wasn't there on a consistent basis. All right, Greg, I'm going to throw three guys at you and you don't have to break every single guy down. Trent, but you kind of give me who you like the most out of them. If you're running, say, an Eagles defense, a four three, you want a right. linebacker. You're probably in you know late second, early third. I'll, I'll throw at you. Baron Browning from Ohio State, Jabril Cox from LSU, and um, let's go with the North Carolina kid, Chaz, Chaz Surratt. Surratt. Yeah, which one of those three is are, are is, is GM Greg Cosell going to take there somewhere in the second or third? Well, Browning is the most fascinating of the group because Browning is also a little freakish. Hmm. He was the number one linebacker recruit when he came out. He was a five-star coming out of Texas. This kid is another freakish athlete. He's 6'3 and an eighth, and he's 241. And he was used in multiple ways at Ohio State in his career there. He was used as a pass rusher, as an edge pass rusher. He's good at it. He was used as a stack backer. He was used outside the box. I mean, this guy played multiple spots. And because he doesn't have quote-unquote production and he didn't play every snap, people say, well, there's something wrong. I can't speak to that. I don't know. But this kid is, he's a little freakish. So his size athleticism movement profile is high, high level. And he's got a really strong looking build with powerful explosive movement traits. So, you know, Browning to me, you have to get to know the kid. I I won't be doing that. Um, Hmm. But he's really, there's so much there athletically to like. Um, the, the other guy there, there's two guys. Cox is an interesting guy. He was a North Dakota State transfer, um, was the player of the year in that division of football, I think, you know, a couple of times. Went to LSU. He's a great athlete. He, he's a coverage player, more than a box player, despite the fact that he's over 6'3", 230. Um, you can line him up. He, he matched up to wide receivers and ran with them. He mm-hmm. matched up to tight ends, and he played him no problem. This kid's a coverage player. He's not really a box player. The physical portion of the game is not his thing. He is a coverage guy, and you got to know that about Jabril Cox. Chaz Surratt was a player I liked a lot. And keep in mind, Chaz Surratt has only played linebacker for two years. So he is an ascending player. He came to North Carolina, you guys might know this, as a quarterback. He was the parade national high school player of the year as a quarterback. The and Surratt when, kids are unbelievable, Greg. Yeah, they're yeah I know. Stage was a, maybe one of the best high school basketball players of, of, of his graduating class in high school. Really. Yeah, so, I mean, you're talking about a guy that's played linebacker for two years. I just think he's scratching the surface. Mm-hmm. And this kid can blitz. He's a really good blitzer. So I, I love this kid on tape. I think there's so much there with him. He's got higher level athletic traits. He needs to get physically stronger. Don't forget, he never played linebacker. He didn't, you know, he didn't do all the work that linebackers have to do. So he needs to get physically stronger. Um, but I think he's got three down traits. He'll start his NFL career as a sub package linebacker. He's got speed, range, coverage ability, and blitz ability. 
I think he's one of the most fascinating linebackers in this draft class, just because he's only played it for two years, but everything is staring at you on film and you know, he'll get better at it. So right, like when you felt real ahead. quick that Browning yeah. though, was the, of the three was maybe the most pro ready and, and can give you I, um, a blend or he did the most in college. Okay. Of, of the three. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the most physically explosive of the three, just when you look at the body type mm -hmm. and the movement. Okay. I, I have a feeling when you're with us at evil genius on Monday, uh, excuse me, the uh, Thursday night of the draft, um, when we're there for our, our drafts, our pre-draft show, you like to talk about guys who are under the radar. And there's a guy you had told me, I think you said you just saw him lately, UAB's Jordan Smith. Is that correct, Greg? Oh, I, yeah. I hadn't seen him lately. but I, okay. yeah. Oh, you saw him. Yeah. Okay. But UAB is not a school we think of for football. So give us an idea. J just give us ideas. This is a guy not a lot of people are talking about, but is a little bit under the radar. Give us an idea of what you thought about him. I watched him well over a month ago, too. So, okay. All right. <clears throat> you know, he was, a, he was a Florida recruit. I mean, this kid was a big-time recruit. He went to Florida. And I guess he was involved in some kind of credit card fraud scheme. You know, who knows? Um, yeah. So he went to JUCO for a year and then went to uh, UAB for two years. I mean, this kid's 6'6 six, six and an eighth and 255. So I don't know if he can get up to 260, 265, because then he's a defensive end in a 4'3". Right. Because right now, I think a lot of teams might see him as an outside backer. But again, if you go to your, your sub, he's going to be a pass rusher. Because that's what he is. He's long. I mean, his arm length and his wingspan are, are positive traits. He's naturally athletic. He's got smooth, fluid movement. He can bend the edge. Um, I think he's got some natural strength and power in his hands. Uh, I, I think this kid is one of the most fascinating pass rush prospects in the draft. Now, he won't go in the first round, yeah. I don't believe. But he's, to me, again, I don't do this, Adam, you know that. But to me, he's he's a day two player for sure. So we've thrown ten guys at you, including the one you just referenced, and you seem to have a, a, a you know a positive at least outlook on a lot of these guys, if not everyone we've broken down here, Greg. So is it fair to say you kind of like this class of linebackers in general that it, that it offers? I don't know how it compares to in the past, but it seems like you like a lot of these day one, day two guys. Well, I will tell you this: this is crazy, but last year more linebackers were chosen in the draft than any other position. So whatever that means, I don't know. But last year, 38 linebackers were chosen in the NFL draft. Hmm. So I don't know if that means that people think linebackers are poor or it just means the later round played out where there were guys, linebackers there that, you know, were there on the guys' draft boards and they said, we're drafting a linebacker. Um, so I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think you're dealing with linebackers now who are far more athletic. And that shows up on tape. You know, Bolton is the guy to me, like I said, he's the litmus test. Good, really good player, really good tape for what he is. Um, there'll be a lot of people who love him. There'll be linebacker coaches who say, I, I just love the way this kid plays. And you'll love the way this kid plays. The tape tells you that. But he's 5'11. Arms are just over 31. Yeah. Which yeah. Is not... So, I mean, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, this is no knock on Nick Bolton. He's not going to be 6'4 tomorrow. Um, right. And he's really fun to watch, but you have to decide if you put him out there in your sub, you know, who's he matching up to if you're going to play man. Mm -hmm. And if you say, Hey, I love the player. We want to play him in sub, but that means you got to play more zone. You know what? Offenses around the league are going to know that pretty damn quick. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's the litmus test, but yeah, all these other kids, they're, they're athletic kids. Uh, and, and they, they fit the, the kind of evolving NFL. And, and again, are they all going to be day one starters? Of course not. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough that nobody's a finished product. What you see on tape is not what the guy is going to be a year or two years or three years from now. Maybe it will be. Maybe there's a guy, this is what he is, and that's what he is. But if a guy is different in a year or two, it's not that he's been evaluated incorrectly. It's this is what the tape shows now. This is all we have now. So that's all you can judge by. Can he be coached? Can he get better with techniques? Can they change his body in an NFL weight room? All those things can happen. But this is what we have now. Awesome. Great stuff. Uh, let me leave you with this really quickly. Um, 
a day three guy or a small school guy that you particularly oh, like other than the, the UAB kid that like kind of a, a Greg Cosell sleeper on day three? Is there someone? Hold that on, you hold know? on, hold yeah, on. I know you got to dig through the databases. I got to go through my uh, my players here. Hold Bust on. Out the scalpel. Oh, the, how about the Arkansas State kid? Rashid? 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 I, I, I did him last summer. I didn't do him again this year. Okay. So. Okay. I'm looking at my linebacker list. Got gotcha. you. There's always somebody on day. All three. right. There will be somebody. Um, oh, Derek Barnes, Purdue. Oh, yeah. yeah. Really, I love that kid's tape. And, and the thing is, last year, in 2019, he was an edge rusher. And he reminded me as an edge rusher, stylistically, even though he weighs he weighed 20 pounds less, he reminded me stylistically of Brandon Graham, of how he rushed the quarterback. Mm -hmm. But this year, he played stack backer. And I really, I think this guy is really a, a good i mean i could make the argument okay and maybe people think i'm nuts i could make the argument based on tape that barnes and nick bolton are very very similar prospects and that because barnes has pass rush ability and therefore could play in your sub not as a cover guy but as a pass rusher that barnes could have more value than bolton you know it's interesting he's just just over an inch taller but his arms are much longer 33 and an eighth that's really long for a guy that is is under six one. That's interesting. Okay, Derek yeah, he Barnes. Ran, he ran better than yep. than um than Bolton. His wingspan is long, and like I said, he played as a pass rusher in 2019, mm -hmm. and he played as a pass rusher this year too when on third down. So this kid can rush the quarterback. All right, great. That will do it for the fourth installment of Inside the Draft with Greg Cosell. Now, we get you twice next week. We'll be doing the fifth installment. Of course, it'll drop Tuesday at 6 a.m. What I think we'll do is revisit where the Eagles are at at that point, you know, 12 right now, and we'll see what goes on there and, and talk about some of the prospects. May get into a few running backs with you, Greg, if what that's positions, all right. What, what positions have we done now, Jeff? I lose track. We have it, done you know? cornerbacks. We've done developmental quarterbacks. We've done pass rushers. And, and we've and done linebackers. Uh, linebackers. So maybe a little offensive line running back. Unless you want to look at safeties, it's up to you. You know, well, Maybe we'll drop a couple of each. Well. I mean, who's going to play safety for the Birds this year? Anthony Harris and uh, hopefully Rodney McLeod will be back there. That's right, Rodney McLeod. We know yeah. it's Anthony Harris, yeah. Right. And then, you know, obviously, Kevon Wallace is a kid they drafted last right. year. And um, well, well, whatever see. you want, you know, me. I make I, fun I, of the Eagles for never drafting safeties in the first three rounds. So, yeah. I mean, you know, you never know. <laughs> you know me, Jeff. I just make it up as we go. Uh, and you do it great. So that'll be the <laughs> first time we get you next week. And then, of course, you will be with us, as Adam mentioned, uh, for our listeners. We'll be doing an NFL draft preview show for the first round Thursday night, 530 to 730 at Evil Genius Beer House or a brewery? Beer House, I believe. It obviously, na obviously named after Kaplan. Yes, uh, thank well, you. Maybe the evil yeah. part. I'm not quite right, sure right, about right, the right, genius, right, right. but at least half named after Kaplan. <clears throat> uh, we'll be there 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., so make sure you go to um, – uh, in, at Inside Birds on Twitter, we'll tweet out the link, link for how you can uh, become part of the great event that we've got thrown on. We're excited about it. It's been uh, a long time. And uh, Greg, we're, we're happy to have you back with us as we preview the first round of the NFL draft uh, that night. So that will do it for Inside the Draft with Greg Cosell. For Greg Cosell and Adam Kaplan, I'm Jeff Mosher. Everybody have a great rest of your week and we'll catch you next week.